The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Welcome to Community Keynotes, Neuroscience and Learning. Our presenter is Dr. Bruce Wexler, professor of psychiatry at Yale University and author of Brain and Culture, Neurobiology, Ideology, and Social Change. Dr. Wexler shares his work in using the brain's neuroplasticity to improve executive functioning skills in children. There are 100 billion neurons in the human brain and each one is directly connected to a thousand other ones and can receive 100 inputs in just a millisecond. It's recognized as the most complex system that we know about in the universe. Thinking, remembering, feeling, the types of things we're concerned about as educators, these are not properties of a single cell in the brain, nor are they properties of a single place in the brain. These are properties of the integrated actions of hundreds of thousands or millions of cells distributed throughout the brain, neural functional systems. So those functional systems are created physically by connections between the neurons. And the key point is that the connections between the neurons are not determined by genetics, but they're shaped instead by experience after birth. And that's the interaction between the individual and the environment, and that's what school is a big part of, the social effort, obviously, to shape the developing brains of our children. We call this postnatal shaping of, of brain structure and function neuroplasticity. The Nobel Prize was awarded in the 1950s by work done that uh, demonstrated this initially. Uh, Carla Schatz at Stanford University has coined the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. Now this is a key idea that we'll come back to. If you can get neurons to fire, you change the way they connect to other neurons. We call it activity-dependent shaping and strengthening of brain function. Key principle here. And we give you a couple of examples now of how dramatic this neuroplastic potential is in the brain. In this study, as you, well, first, as you know, there are parts of our brain that are primarily concerned with processing auditory information and parts of our brain that are primarily connected uh, with processing visual information. And you might think that those would be pretty hardwired parts of our brains. They're so basic information processing. What these scientists did at MIT was in young ferrets, a small animal, they rerouted visual information to what is usually the auditory or listening part of the brain. And they asked two questions. Can the ferrets see with the listening part of their brain? And what will that part of their brain look like under the microscope? Because ordinarily, the visual part of the brain, its cellular organization, is different from the auditory part of the brain. So what will happen if we just send information from the eyes to the part of the brain that usually gets information from the ears? Well, the first thing was the ferrets could see with that part of their brain. The second thing was that that part of the brain actually reorganized itself to look like a visual cortex. This is a normal visual cortex. And you see all the, we call these ocular dominance columns, these little black circles. They're like a television screen where you get points of information represented and the area around them that discriminates that point from the next point. The auditory listening cortex doesn't normally look like that. But here, you can see it does. It has assumed that same uh, architecture. Uh, what happens to visual areas of the brain in people who are born blind? That part of the brain is no longer getting any visual input. Does it do nothing? No. In fact, what happens in blind people, this normally visual part of the brain becomes an additional auditory processing area. So almost like the ferret study, that plasticity allowed that part of the brain, that, since it wasn't getting a visual input, to do other things. And it's one of the reasons that blind people have better auditory memory than sighted people. There's more of their brain actually devoted to processing that information. What happens if you play to your brain if you play a musical instrument for many hours as a child? 
Here we can see actual changes in the structure of the brain. And what I want you to look at first is this left side of the brain, which controls the right hand in a string player. Now, the right hand does this relatively simple, repetitive bowing motion. While the left hand is doing all this fancy, rapid fingering movement, much more complicated for the brain. If you do that for many hours, that actually changes the structure of your brain, as you can see with the naked eye here. See the volume here on this left side of the sensory motor area that's controlling that simple movement in the right hand. And look at the expansion here. See how these have filled out more, this part of the brain on the other side that's responsible for all the fancy fingering movements? And what happens if you're a piano player where you're using both hands? Look at that, two buffed up motor cortices in <laughs> piano players. Well, what happens if, to your brain if you practice gymnastics for many hours as a child? Here's a study that was done in China uh, where, the, where these particular world-class athletes started training when they were four and a half years old and they had trained for 16 years. And they looked then with MRI imaging at the connectivity between different parts of the brain and all the areas that are colored in magenta are areas, th this is a schematic representation of different parts of the brain and the degree to which they're functionally connected. All the magenta colored areas are areas where the gymnasts had stronger connections in a control group than a control group and the blue areas are where they had less connectivity than the control group. So we see a different brain structure wired differently as a result of this activity. So people have said, well, maybe we can harness this neuroplasticity for things, deliberate problems that we want to address. And there's a wonderful book called The Brain That Shapes Itself by Norman Doidge. And then he refers to a community of, of um, neuroplasticians who have I have used this for a variety of therapeutic purposes, and this is one of the more dramatic ones to me. Blind people can now see through their tongue. It's called sensory substitution device. And uh, the tongue has many, many um, receptor density of sensory receptors. So they can put a metal plate the size of a quarter on the tongue and use that again like a TV screen. So every little point on this metal device stimulates a different point on the tongue, just like a TV screen. And the brain learns to use that information. Here's a, a person in a training situation where the device is in this, this laboratory situation. She has a device in, in her mouth on this tongue, on her tongue. And any of us with five hours of training with our eyes completely covered can use this to do a simple reading chart like you, with an E to tell whether the E is this way, this way, that way, or that way after just five hours of training. Our goal is to see if we can harness neuroplasticity through brain exercises to improve executive function in young children when neuroplasticity is the greatest. So I've mentioned a couple of terms here, neuroplasticity, executive function, two main ones. I hope I've given you a sense of neuroplasticity, what I mean by it and what it can do. Uh, so what is executive function? Well, executive function is a group of thinking or cognitive abilities essential for managing information and also managing oneself. Uh, this definition from a, either current or former director of the professional services at the National Center for Learning Disabilities Quote, executive functioning involves activating, orchestrating, monitoring, evaluating, adapting different strategies to accomplish different tasks. You have to be able to analyze situations, plan and take action, focus and maintain attention, adjust actions along the way, cognitive flexibility. These are the set of executive functions. This uh, definition from WebMD online, what's it good for executive function? What do we need them for? We need them to manage our time, manage our attention deployment, to switch focus back and forth from one thing to another, plan and organize, remember things, working memory is part of executive function, curb inappropriate speech or behavior. This is self-control, self-regulation and to integrate the past experience or knowledge with present action, the planning part 
of what we of executive functions. A lot of literature now, experimental literature, is showing the importance of executive function in school performance. Uh, it's a better predictor than IQ of school readiness for academic achievement. I can tell you that uh, your school district is on the forefront of applying that with your kindergarten readiness programs that are focusing specifically on developing executive function skills before the kids come into kindergarten just for this reason. A teachers report that the most important determinant of classroom success in kindergarten and early grades is the extent to which children can sit still, pay attention, and follow rules. It's not because we want them just to be obedient. These are skills that are required to function in the environment. And unfortunately, some children come to school without those skills, as you know, for a variety of different reasons. Some come without those skills because they haven't had the life experiences before they get to school that are necessary to provoke development. And others come to them because they've had a variety of individual medical conditions or past experiences that compromise or limit the development of their executive function. They're then placed in a situation where demands of them are made of them that through no fault of their own, they aren't neurocognitively prepared to meet. And that sets up the difficult challenge that you all know so that they can be successful rather than frustrated so they can engage with the curriculum. And what we would love to be able to do is to help strengthen those executive functions so that they can take better advantage of everything else around them. How can we use brain training to improve executive function? This is the question I asked myself a number of years ago. I, I started doing brain training work uh, using computer technology, as I'll describe to try and harness neuroplasticity to actually to treat cognitive deficits in older people with serious medical psychiatric conditions because we, we don't have any medications that can help the cognitive problems, say, with people with schizophrenia. And those are also include executive function problems. So as, uh, this was a question I've been working on, actually, f for almost 20 years now. But only in the last five or six years did I say, well, why not apply this to younger children when the brain is most plastic and when we can have an impact early in the life course? And hopefully, as I said a moment ago, enable those children to take better advantage and have a better self-image because they have a, a more positive interaction with the environment around them, more rewarding. So how can we use brain training? We can use it to help people who are blind use a different part of their brain to see that we should be able to use the same idea and these same methods to help develop targeted, under-functioning neurocognitive systems. So the basic principles of brain training <clears throat> is you first have to identify a target brain and thinking process to strengthen through activation. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to do all X, Y, and Z, and that's going to help. The more, if, the more helpful, to be the most helpful, you have to know what it is you're trying to fix. What part of the brain are you trying to engage and activate? What are the neurocognitive processes that need to be improved? Now we're talking about executive function, and we know that that is supported primarily by the frontal lobes of the brain. So here we have a very clear target, frontal lobes of the brain, and a set of functions that we've just described, executive functions. So then we have to create exercises or activities that require use of these processes and then activate them. Now, people tend not to use things that don't work well, you know, that they don't get reinforced for or that they have trouble with. They often tend to avoid it, which only makes the problem worse. I call it a disuse atrophy from the point of view of the brain. So, but that's a challenge right there. We've got a target, but it's an underfunctioning system. So how do we engage with it? And the key point is you've got to engage with it with an activity that they can succeed at. You have to make it simple enough so that although the system is compromised, it can be engaged and this child can experience success and the system will be active and the internal brain processes associated with pleasure and success are also part of neuroplasticity. We have to put that whole package together. Now we make them easy enough so that the children with limitations can engage. But then we have to know how to progressively challenge them. 
and how to optimize that balance between challenge and success for each child. Because as you know better than I, how different each of the children are, even if they have the same age, even if they have a similar label, they're really different in their capabilities. This is well known to educators. This challenge of increasing difficulty in small steps to optimize the challenge and success balance for each child is really the key. It's, uh, many of you know Vygotsky, the great Russian neuropsychologist and educator, talked about the zone of proximal development. You want the child to be in that place where they can succeed, but they're challenged. Critically important for children with special needs, especially children who have a mixture of areas of strength and weakness, even more of a challenge to get into the right space for them. And, and frankly, this is the secret sauce of good brain training programs is the ability to individualize the experience for each child. Because there are lots of brain training programs. I'm going to mention a few to you. I'm not going to go into the secret sauce now, not because I don't want to or it, uh, it's a secret. It's not really a secret. I'm happy to talk about our secret sauce. But I just want to get the idea across that this is where programs really do differ. From. One of the two areas where brain programs differ from each other is how well they've defined the target and how well they can individualize to the user. Now, we, computers play a key part of the individualization. We couldn't do this, impossible, without the computer technology. We use the computers to monitor constantly each child's performance and adjust it just every few seconds. Now, a variety of computer-presented brain exercises are available from a number of different companies. I'm not going to go into detail on describing each of these and what their relative strengths and weaknesses are. Just to let you know, there's a, a company uh, called CogMed does primarily spatial memory training, but it's the children-focused program, and it's used in schools, and it does target children with ADHD. There's a program, a company called Happy Neuron, and that's a, a set of games that uh, focuses on memory, attention, for adults and home use primarily. Lumosity, many of you have heard about probably. They even have ads on the Super Bowl. That's for adults, but they're starting to make some programs for children. A menu of a variety of different short games you can play. Another company just started in the UK uh, called Brainbow, and they have a similar product to Lumosity's, uh, but better, I think, in a variety of ways, called Peak. And the scientific learning company has been in the schools for a long time. They have a, one of the very first brain training programs for children with language acquisition problems called Fast Forward. So now what I'm going to do is tell you what I know most about. It's, it's the program that I've been working with, and it's something I can actually describe to you and show you evidence that it works and talk about what we're doing here in Fairfax with it. And as has already been mentioned by the superintendent, our program has, has, has three components. as a computer-presented brain exercises, but also physical exercise. Very important part of it, I think, and I'll, I'll talk about why that's the case. And it's also an assessment program. I told you we're constantly monitoring how each child is doing. We need that to adjust the program. But actually, it can provide a lot of information to teachers about the strengths and weaknesses of each child. I mean, we are capturing constantly performance in a ranging variety of problems that we can then translate into actual profile reports on the child, similar to a neuropsych exam that costs $3,000. We can produce that just as a extra from the data that we're collecting automatically as the children are doing the computer exercises. So we have those three parts. As we said, I, I've gotten some uh, awards from the uh, director's office at the National Institute of Health for these programs with external reviewers saying that they think they are the most sophisticated brain trainings. That's our secret sauce uh, because of their ability to individualize. I'll just give you a little feel for the games, but um, they're being used in a variety of schools here, and I imagine parents are welcome at some point. It can be arranged to come in and see the, uh, them in action in the classroom if you're interested or if you haven't already. Uh, one of the things for engagement, there is a problem engaging kids to do some of these games. Uh, many of them are used to doing um, high stimulation, high arousal, arcade-like, computer entertainment games, and they can do those for hours, but it doesn't fix their problems with, with effortful attention in the classroom. 
Some companies are trying to make games like that because the kids will like them. But to me, it makes no sense. They're already doing those games. And frankly, I think those games bypass the executive functions that we're trying to train and engage the child through a different part of the brain's mechanism, which is associated with this high arousal, arcade-like pleasure. So, but we need to engage them. So we, we work closely with some entertainment game companies to employ principles of game design. And one of them is giving kids choice. So at the beginning, we have uh, a, a suite of a half a dozen games. But underneath, they do very similar things. And we know what things the games do, but they look different on the outside. And the kids get a choice. So they get to pick one of, of the six, three. They get given three options here to say what game do you want to play next. But our program keeps track of every pro game they picked. And if their choices get too out of whack because they keep picking one of them, it just doesn't appear again as one of their choices. So um, <laughs> they have choice, but we have some control to make sure that they have the experience that we think is appropriate. <clears throat> um, this is an uh, example of one of the games. Um, <clears throat> In this game, game this uh, circle moves all around from these boxes, and, and uh, it's called the magic lens. And sometimes it comes over a, a crate in which there is a monkey. <clears throat> and your job is to help the monkeys get free. So if there's a monkey in there, you have to click on that fast enough, and then the monkey gets out and runs away. And so that's just simple attention. That's, you have to watch that and keep looking at it. But then we add into it, there are two types of monkeys. And one type of monkey you want to let free, and the other monkey you can't let free. You have to let that one stay in the crate. So then we've added response inhibition. You're clicking as fast as you can for the monkey you want to get out, and then you have to inhibit yourself from not responding. Very hard for many young children. I'll sit there next to them, and they'll click, click, and then they'll click the wrong one, and they'll see that other monkey run away, and they'll say, oh, no, I'm not supposed to do that. But it's hard for them to back it up and stop. <clears throat> and then we have it so that, oh, <clears throat> now, you release, now you're supposed to release a, type A monkey, but now stop that. Now you're supposed to release type B monkey. So we've added another executive function called cognitive flexibility. And then we'll put it in. You only release um, monkeys if two monkeys of the same kind are in a row. So if you see two monkey A's in a row, you release the second one. If you see two monkey bees in a row, you release that one. So now we've added working memory, all within the same game. And we're able to monitor each child's performance on all these dimensions and individualize when they move to the next one. And then at the higher levels, there are two of these circles on the screen at the same time. So you're following both of them. So then we have even more demand, and we have multiple simultaneous attention. That just gives you a flavor of what you can do with things like this. <clears throat> And this game is a category game. This is actually turns out about the kids' favorites. I mean, I love to look at data, and one of the things we can look at and see which games are the kids choosing the most. And this is the one they like the most, it turns out. So right now, uh, this pirate Pete is in a packing panic, and you have to help him find the things he needs to take on his explorations of the island. And right now, he's, he's looking for uh, big animals. So when he's throwing all these things out, you have to click on them before they move off the screen. It starts with very simple things, just looking for numbers, looking for letters, then for animals, and then it'll go to big animals. So now you've got to have a more discriminating thing. Then it'll rotate. You have to look for uh, article clothing, food, article clothing, food. And at the highest levels, you have to look for any two things that are in the same category. We don't tell you the category. So if you can find any two animals on the screen at the same time, you click on them. So that gives you a feel of how the games develop. Now, I already said this. These games are not the high stimulation, high arousal games uh, for the reasons I said. <clears throat> now, we also have physical exercises in the program. And why do we do that? Well, it turns out that exercise all by itself increases neuroplasticity. Aerobic exercise after school improves academic performance. And I would say another nice thing about Fairfax County Public Schools is that you still seem to have phys ed. And you have, um, and you have a very committed and sophisticated phys ed staff, too. I, I will say that because we work with them. Um, anyway, just simple aerobic exercise after school improves academic performance. 
Also, when you think about it, the brain doesn't have an entirely separate system for the type of thinking it does when you're seeing how a ball is moving and you're running to catch it, as opposed to when you're thinking about an idea and trying to move it forward into different variations. Many of the same brain areas that are used in thinking when you're sitting at a desk are used when you're doing sports activities. So it's another opportunity for us to engage these systems in a very different way which gives us more time with the kids to activate these systems. But it also helps generalize the benefits so that the system is not being activated only in front of a computer. So we have designed physical exercises that have cognitive components so they actually engage the same target neurocognitive systems as do the computer systems, but now in the context of whole body activity and social interaction. And that, of course, allows us to layer on some additional social things that we mix in with the, with the cognitive aspects in those exercises. There has been now, in the last couple of years, a series of studies coming out showing the benefit of physical exercises specifically for kids with a variety of learning problems. More of the studies are ADHD focused, uh, but it's a new area. For all the reasons I just said about the importance of physical exercise, this is now being studied more and more. I'm not going to go into each of these studies. I just wanted to show you that there are a number of them coming out about the advantages to children. Um, I just mentioned this last one. This one was uh, an aquatic exercise program. What's nice about it was that they had a control group. It was 90 minutes of exercise. They had more free swimming exercise, but then they also had exercise in the pool that required more cognitive function. And then they used a formal test in the laboratory test, uh, the go-no-go test of response inhibition. And they showed that the swimming had increased the ability to inhibit uh, when you're supposed to inhibit more than data control activity. So uh, this is a, a promising and important area that I think nationwide is going to just start coming back. Uh, I just can't believe it won't come back because the research is so convincing. And it's nice that it's, not, that it's already here. <laughs> in Fairfax. So our, we have a whole manualized developed uh, exercise program that actually fits with the uh, PE curricular requirements, so it can be plugged into that. Uh, they also start simply. So here's an exercise at the very beginning. Children are, are understand to stand. That this is my space. That's your space. There'll be a circle to stay in. This is my body. I'm paying attention to my space, my body, and staying inside my space. And then you can add balancing to it from like a simple yoga thing. We have an exercise called brain crane. One of the schools we saw the kids doing brain crane in the hallways between classes. So we knew that we had gotten into the culture there. Um, but then the games become, become much more complicated as we add in all sorts of different cognitive activities. Here's, there's two bean bags that kids are passing around in a circle. And you start with a red bean bag. And, it has a pattern. If I give it to one person, they have to throw it to a different person, to a different person. And then they have to say thank you to the person who threw it to them. So we add another level on that. And then we put a red bean bag in the circle. And that one has a different pattern. So if you get the red bean bag, you have to say thank you to that person and throw it to a different person than who gets the green bean bag. And what we want in these exercises is for everybody to have their cognitive systems going the whole time. We don't want them to be sitting and waiting for their turn. And then that sort of thing, they're watching you know, to see whether they, where everybody's throwing it and whether they're throwing it to the right person and whether they're saying thank you. So for that whole time, that physical activity is going on and they're paying attention to each other, that these target neural systems are active. And I'm really excited now about some changes we're working on in this program. We have a, a, there's a wonderful simple exercise thing called the agility ladder. It's just like a rope ladder on the ground, if you can imagine. Just a ladder on the ground, like people, sort of like old hopscotch, but it's just a ladder, space, space, space. And the simple thing, you can just have kids jump, 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 two feet in each space. But then you can make it two feet, one feet, two feet, one feet. And you can make the patterns as complicated as you want. And I've heard teachers say, have the kids make up their own patterns and say, remember in math we were talking about patterns? Now you're going to make a pattern here, and you're going to follow that pattern with your body when you go through that. But what I'm excited about now is putting two of those next to each other for kids with ADHD and tell them it's not just that you have to go through this. You have to go through it in sync. 
together. And so now we're getting them to pay attention to the other child and almost helping to develop uh, theory of mind, it's called, a sense of what the other person is thinking and planning. So coordinating activities by two groups. Have two people, two children throw a ball back and forth, and then have two throwing it this way back and forth. And so they have to be mindful of what each other is doing. So those are new variations I'm really uh, interested in myself. We have a people in my lab developing still a whole new exercise program following these principles and, and things for social um, skills. I told you also that uh, we're in assessment. We capture, I insisted we capture every keystroke of every child because I knew how I had designed the pro how many assumptions I made when I designed the programs. I need to know how to make them better. But as I said before, we can now analyze that data to create a profile of each child's cognitive strengths and weaknesses. We, uh, we also wanted to know whether our programs were working. So, you know, how, how can you find that out? We didn't want to just say they get better at our games. So I went and got the NIH toolbox of tests that that expert committee had said were the best tests actually of executive functions specifically, and we were the first ones to make them web-based. So now we give reports to Fairfax on each child's executive function skills uh, according to these NIH toolbox tests. And we have the biggest database in the world on the NIH toolbox tests. But we built it in because of our commitment to our, our science. You know, we wanted to know whether it was working. It was only later we realized that it's a valuable additional thing for the schools. So let me show you a little bit of data that's encouraging to us in terms of its uh, potential of this to work. We have a, a randomized controlled trial going on at Yale. I will also say that there are researchers now at six or seven institutions, including the head of the International ADHD Society in Brazil who have asked to use our program in formal uh, research studies. So we'll get more information about how it's working and, uh, from those independent studies. But this study is done at Yale and the children do our program and the parents give us ratings of whether the children's symptoms of ADHD improved or not. Now you parents probably know that your input um, is complicated and uh, <laughs> from a research point of view, we, the researchers say, well, first of all, the parents are not blind to whether the child was getting the program or not. We have a control group and the parents know whether their child's in the control group. It's a waitlist control. That group gets to do the program later. But the other parents know their children are in the program. And so from a science point of view, that's a little bit uh, compromised because the parents might be biased to say their kids got better because they knew they were in the program. On the other hand, parents know more about their children than anybody else. And um, with ADHD, that's particularly important because ADHD manifests itself differently in different situations. And the parents get to see the kids in a whole variety of situations. So we really value the data from the parents, but from a science point of view, it's harder to convince people because they aren't blind, the parents. So what we found here with the parents' ratings, though, was that the children who took our program were two times as likely as a control group to show a significant improvement in symptoms, according to their parents. So that's a nice finding. But I said to myself, how could we confirm this? Now, I've told you that we have built in these NIH tests of cognition. So then, I said, let's just look at the ones who got our program. The parents said some of them responded. And other parents said, I know your child, my child was in your program, but really, frankly, my child did not get any better. So we have two groups now who both got the program, and the parents have told us this group got better and this group didn't. So I said, well, let's look at the built-in objective tests of sustained attention and response inhibition in these two groups. And the results are dramatic. This is the improvement on the flanker test from the NIH toolbox of focused attention. The children whose parents said they got better had highly significant improvement. And the, parent, and the children whose parents said they didn't get better did not improve at all. 
Same thing with the goal no go test of response inhibition. So, the parents were right. And I'm so pleased to be able to confirm that type of data from the parents' observation, despite the qualifications that I told you that exist from a science point of view with these objective tests. Not only were the parents right that the kids who they said responded also got better in cognition. They got better according to the parents and their behavior. They also got better in these formal tests of cognition. Uh, this is some data for, from Fairfax from last year. And this is general classroom data. Again, these NIH tests I, I just described to you. This is um, this focused attention. And there's a condition in it where, it's, where distractors are there. And the key measure is how fast can you get the right response even when they're distractors. So it gets better if you improve. That number goes down here, that slope, because that's reaction time. These are kindergartners. Um, these are first graders, and these are second graders. What you can see there right away is what you would expect, right? Kindergartners are slower than first graders, who are slower than second graders at the start. To me, that's very reassuring, just to let you know. <laughs> because, you know, we made, I told you, we're the first ones to make these tests web based, first ones to try and have teachers administer them in the classroom so that knowledge can become more widely available. But we weren't sure were we going to get valid data or not that way. So here, this tells us that we have what we expect. And then you can see the improvement. Whoops. And um, all three groups improved. The kindergartners improved most dramatically. And so you, you can see that kindergartners, after doing this program for four months, were significantly better, say, than first graders were at the beginning of the program. So that within that four months, they've gained more than one year uh, by using the benchmark of what a first grader has when they come in. Uh, this is data from another school district, urban school district, where they used our program in a class. The principal just did on their own initiative in one class and then uh, not in a, another class. And these were tests not given by us now. These are the Pearson formal tests of academic performance. And this classroom here is the one that got our program. And this was a classroom that didn't get our program. And you can see that, oh, actually in this one data, that's what I was trying to look at so I could see, tell you correctly. This is the district-wide data rather than another classroom. Because in that school, they, they, we just had the classroom data from the did, that did our program. And this tells you, green means the proportion of kids that are meeting proficiency standards. Yellow means the proportion of the kids that are on the border or we're worried about them. And red are the kids that are way behind. And that's, this is in the fall and the spring. And the proportion stayed relatively the same district-wide. But look what happened to the one classroom. And this was a school that was 95% free lunch. So it was a, uh, you know, a ch more challenging school for the uh, school system to engage. And they had not seen that type of high, that proportion of green on these graphs. And then this was uh, another school where they actually had a controlled classroom inside the same school. One classroom got our program and one didn't. And here we have both district-wide data, controlled classroom data, and data from the class that got our program. And this is in uh, 49% free lunch, and this is the uh, Pearson reading test for first graders. Oh, um, I'm sorry, a math test. The other one was reading. We need more data like this. Um, it's pretty exciting and statistically significant, but it's still just, and we're working closely with Fairfax to get data just like this from last year's group, where we have five or 600 children in, uh, in about 30 different classrooms. So we have a lot of data there that will let us look to see with you all whether our program is working or not. And there are a lot of reasons I'm hoping it is, but we have to see. <laughs> I've told you that we have these brain training programs that deal with attention, the executive set of executive functions, attention, memory, cognitive flexibility, use of categories. We showed that there's some improvement here over the course of a whole year in academic outcomes. That's what we want. But I asked another question. What if you gave attention training right before you did a math lesson? 
Uh, you could think of it as a warm-up of that attention system in the brain. Would that improve math learning? And how about reading? Would it improve reading? Or is it that you need attention training to improve math, but you need memory training to improve reading? Or cognitive flexibility training to improve reading? So you see, this is a quite uh, exciting potential for new ways to uh, combine <coughs> curricular content learning with this neuroscience of brain training. Now, it may be that for one individual, they need attention training before they do math, but another individual needs memory training before they do math. All this can be done with this technology. So, um, I proposed this idea to the, actually the Roddenberry Foundation, that's the foundation that, um, from the founder of Star Trek. Um, they, they decided that they wanted to do uh, something with their money in the education area, and they got together a group of consultants, and their consultants found us and asked us to present some ideas to them. And so I presented this idea to them. So they have funded us to create a new program. I showed you the games we already had that train those executive functions. So now we have to create a second grade math curriculum teaching game and a second grade reading curriculum teaching game. And we worked as closely as we could and we had valuable input from your curriculum specialists here. And they gave us funds to have that program created and now, and some funds to support its implementation in the school system here. And just a couple weeks ago, literally, except for all the snow. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we started uh, implementing this program for the first time ever here in Fairfax so that we could see whether or not we can actually do that, actually impact in a more proximal, immediate sense and differentiate for each child what type of brain activity, brain warm-up activity is going to help them learn the curricular content the best. Uh, this is the uh, math game. It's based on a scale where you have to make balances in second grade curriculum, very interested in numeracy, just understanding the concepts of number and uh, concept of 10, units of 10, the differences between subtraction and addition, comfort working with bigger numbers. So we had all of these things put into a game. And, and then for the uh, reading uh, game, it's based on phonetics, phonics, which is a major focus for second grade and this idea of word chains, where you have to pick a word from the net over here that will go with the next word that's on the chain here. So you look at that word and you find the one here that differs only from it according to a certain sound rule. Uh, so it may just be it rhymes with it or something like that. But anyway, this is taken out of the curriculum. And education has borrowed from other branches of science to its benefit psychology, cognitive science, and now neuroscience. It's got information that's relevant to the developing brain. How, how could it not? So the challenge for us is to figure out how to use that information and, and translate it into uh, meaningful activities that are actually helpful for children. So, <laughs> Thank you for your sustained attention and cognitive flexibility. I uh, love exercise for them. This has been Community Keynotes, Neuroscience and Learning, recorded at the Fairfax County Public Schools Special Education Conference. For more information about this series, please visit the Fairfax Network website at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network.